For their homelands, for adventure, for revenge, the internationals joined the battle for the sky. We had no doubts in our minds about who the good guys and the bad guys were. You have to see the white of their eyes to be sure to kill them. We were keen to fight. Spring 1940, spearheaded by the Luftwaffe, German armies occupy Poland, the Low Countries, Norway, and France. Only Great Britain and the Royal Air Force stand between Hitler and victory. The captive nations reel under the weight of a German occupation. Devastation, humiliation is the fate of millions. Some vow to escape. They live for the chance to take vengeance on the conqueror. To fly alongside the pilots of the RAF. They will be known as the Internationals. Johnny Johnson, RAF, will command one of the first international squadrons. Usually, the best squadron we found, the best fighter squadron, was a squadron made, made up of mixed na nationalities, a couple of Poles, uh, a Norwegian, a Canadian, an Australian, a couple of English, and so that was the best mixed squadron. Johnson is quick to recognize the courage of these pilots. There was an Australian, and his squadron commander was shot down and had to be bailed out, and the Australian, whose name escapes me at the moment, said, the CO can't get in his dinghy. He was off Sherbrooke somewhere in those icy waters. And he said, I'm going to give him a hand. And he bailed out too to try and help his CO. And I thought that was the most remarkable act of bravery, really. None of them were I've ever seen again. I was leading my uh, squadron back from a sweep over, or, or an escort over France. And... Uh, I saw these two aircraft in front of me. Wilfred Duncan Smith, a seasoned RAF commander, will score 19 kills. And one on the right, uh, his starboard, sorry, his port wing must, be, must have been out of action because his chum had his wing underneath him and he was holding him up, which was a very dangerous thing for him to do because, you know, it was almost a mid-air collision. And he carried him all the way as far as he could inland, and then gave him time to bail out. The internationals flew with a clear sense of purpose. Miroslav Mansfeld's father was killed after the occupation of Czechoslovakia. But we were trained to kill. It was for my mother. That was it. And then came my country. Barely 17, Ragnar Dogger escapes from Norway and makes his way to England. I think being a refugee from, from Norway or any other country made us more like professional fighters. We didn't have to go home for dinner and uh, your mother didn't tell you, be careful and all that. Fighter pilots from around the Commonwealth pay their own way to get into the fight. Andrew McKenzie, Canadian, will score eight kills over Britain and Europe. We were so keen to fly and so keen to, to seek out the Hun and destroy him. That, uh, the whole spirit uh, in the squadron was remarkably high. The United States is neutral, but a handful of Americans feel that this is also their war. They volunteer to fly with the Eagle Squadrons of the Royal Air Force. James Goodson will score 15 kills. He is among those Americans in London ordered to return to the United States when war breaks out. So I rather reluctantly got on the first ship I could, which happened to be the Athenia. A few hours after war was declared, it was torpedoed, and I found myself in the Atlantic. 
I was fished out of the Atlantic by a Norwegian tanker and taken to Southern Ireland and then made my way back to uh, Scotland. And uh, there I saw the English uh, building a recruiting station for the RAF. So I asked them if an American could join their RAF and eventually they said yes he could but because of the strict neutrality of the United States we were warned that uh, I would lose my American nationality which indeed I did. The internationals had some special problems. To fly together they had to talk together. To start with it was a hell of a thing to learn to speak English. Oh, I could have seen anything like this before, neither have I. 4,000 pounds have just gone up. Yeah, good shirt. We were never allowed to use our own language, and um, we had to use the RAF slang all the time. The internationals are deadly in combat. Miroslav Mansfeld is on patrol in a usually quiet sector over the Irish coast. Ground control alerts him to an approaching gaggle of German planes. The first one, uh, I came uh, sort of 90 degrees on him, so I couldn't fire really. So he escaped just, I was firing just a little bit in front. But the next one, he came right behind him and uh, started to fire. And he blew up right in front of me and then down. Mansfeld gets three kills in the battle. As the internationals hone their hunter skills, a brotherhood grows between them. That brotherhood, beyond nationality, is forged in fire. The internationals will help change the course of the war. Putting their lives on the line for a common cause, the internationals and the pilots of the RAF develop mutual respect and admiration. We learn to admire the stiff upper lip of RAF because they were very calm and cool on their radios. And we uh, picked that up. So even if you were badly shot up, or scared to death. You sort of took 30 seconds and uh, then you, you yourself came on the radio very calm and uh, like an RAF pilot. I was told when I went to take over the Canadian wing in the uh, beginning of 1943 and they were based at Kennedy that they were wild men and they got drunk and long hair and they wouldn't take kindly to an Englishman and so on. They were real disciplined, never shaved, nothing. They were a marvelous bunch of people. They were first class. Peter Brothers begins flying at age 15. He's a seasoned fighter pilot when the Battle of Britain begins. So I had the uh, very good fortune to form an Australia, all Australian Spitfire squadron. They were a super bunch of characters. No problems. And they were a splendid bunch of chaps to have. Once we've engaged them, I want you to go straight in home and try to keep together. They were resilient, uh, quick to react, and of course they have all have wonderful eyesight. At first the British are hesitant to use foreign volunteers in combat. Desperate for pilots, the RAF activates Polish Squadron 303. Their performance ends all doubts. Uh, of course the Poles were very, in 1940, were very bitter and uh, 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 they fought with an extreme sort of uh, bitterness and cynicism and that sort of thing and showed no mercy and often gave up their own lives when they ran people and so on. Polish ace Stanislaw Skalski will score 18 kills over Europe and North Africa. I will use some silly expression. I mean, we were sportsmen only. In this sport, come one thing you have, you, each one have to remember that you're fighting for your life as well. So you're not to kill somebody, but to win. Francis Gabreski flies in the Pacific, but looks toward Europe. 
As a Polish-American, the exploits of the Polish pilots flying with the RAF give him special pride. Reading the papers, I said, a Polish squadron, the Polish pilots in the Battle of Britain were uh, shooting down airplanes, and I said, gee, that's Polish. I, I can speak Polish, I can understand Polish, I can read Polish and so forth. I can find some, if I could find some sort of good way to get into the European theater, uh, I could possibly get some good and valuable training on the hands of the Polish pilots. Gubreski manages to get his transfer to England, where he flies with the fabled Poles. And they were a bunch of little tigers, but they knew the strong points of their aircraft, they knew the weakness of their aircraft, and above all, they had respect for all the German pilots. Seven Americans fly in the Battle of Britain. The ranks of the American Eagle squadrons begin to swell. And they undergo a quick baptism of fire. They had a very accelerated training, and I think probably looking back on it, for propaganda reasons and other reasons, they were probably thrown into combat a little too early. Therefore, the third Eagle Squadron, 133, they went off on a mission escorting bombers to Morlaix in France, and none of them came back. And it was a very dramatic uh, scene when I went to uh, Debden and uh, went into the officers sleeping quarters and went into room after room they hadn't had time to clean up the personal effects and here were half lit written letters dear mom everything's fine and the the, the toothbrushes and the shaving cream and so on uh, really brought it home all these empty rooms in september 1942 the eagle squadrons become part of the u.s army air forces Flying under their own flag means a lot to the Eagles, in pride and in pay. The extra money provides an unexpected advantage. The Englishmen used to go off to the pub and drink uh, beer, and uh, we'd go off with their girlfriends, and, and they used to make the comment that the trouble with the Americans was that they were overpaid, oversexed, and over here. The American Eagles discover a special use for the May Day emergency radio channel. And sometimes coming back, I used to switch on to that channel, and instead of hearing uh, what I had expected to hear, I heard these people saying, Would you please telephone Daphne on May 3637 and tell her I'll be a little late for our date at the Savoy. We were always full of fun, full of jokes, full of enthusiasm. And, of course, it was always the other guy that was going to get shot down, not you. The internationals take on the Luftwaffe in every combat theater. As Allied might grows, dreams of revenge turn to thoughts of victory. Robert Spurdle a New Zealander with the RAF. One day we were very lucky to intercept the last raid by JU-87s uh, against England and their fighter escort had foolishly gone above a cloud layer and our squadron 74 caught these Germans coming in and uh, it was just straight slaughter. But it was a marvellous thing to, for once, catch them and really give it to them. Fighter pilots take pride in their skill, bravado, and the planes they fly. They also develop a keen respect for old-fashioned luck. You know, during the war, I, I always saying, Napoleon used to say, if you want to go on war, you need three things. First of all, money. Second, money. Third, money. I used to the same thing to the war. Luck, luck, and luck. I was shot down twice during the Battle of Britain even. I don't know how I'm still alive. So luck is with me. 
Colin Gray, a New Zealander, gets lucky when a Messerschmitt bores in for the kill. Somebody said uh, bandits. Uh, he managed to get on the, the tail of one of them and it gave him a good burst and I was surprised to see him pull up and bail out. And while I was watching him do this, there was a hell of a clatter like somebody running a stick along a corrugated iron fence and I realised I was being shot at. And this gave me a bit of a fright. But uh, perhaps fortunately for me, one of the cannon shells hit uh, the uh, port wing and jammed the ailerons in the um, up position so that the aircraft flicked over into a dive. I couldn't have devised a better escape manoeuvre. Desmond Sheen, Australian, will score seven kills in his Spitfire. His luck holds during a furious battle. I was sent up um, to attack a, a formation of DO 215s. I was attacking this uh, with, when, when I was shot down and I had to bail out over Kent. This was about 12,000 feet. And I had a grandstand view of the, the whole of the battle because there were bombs falling in London, others over Dover, and there were dogfights overhead, and an ME-109 went down in flames quite close to me. I bailed out and landed as uh, large as a feather in the field. Early in 1943, the momentum of the war turns. The fight is carried to the enemy in the skies over Fortress Europe. We began sweep operations over the channel. Uh, they weren't ex extremely popular with us because uh, we had to fight over enemy territory now and uh, they were fairly hairy operations. Now on the defensive, German forces are spread thin over Europe, Norway, Russia, the Balkans, Greece, Italy, and North Africa. The Luftwaffe rushes new pilots into action. Most are no match for the combat-savvy international squadrons. Ragnar Dogger is over Germany and looks up at a formation of Luftwaffe bombers. We attacked from below and uh, shot down 12 of them and didn't lose any. But later we found out that these planes were flown to forward bases by inexperienced pilots. So it didn't take very much to shoot them down, which was a pity. The Luftwaffe is short of planes, but the pilots are long on discipline and courage. I remember a case of getting on the tail of two aircraft. As you know, in the fighter world, you fly in pairs. And the number two looks after the number one. And they were so well disciplined that uh, I was lining up my aircraft to shoot down this uh, number two. And I was only about uh, 50 feet away from him. And he was, instead of breaking off and leaving his number one uh, to be shot down, uh, he preferred to die. Beginning in 1943, Allied bombers attack enemy targets around the clock. Francis Gabreski will use his experience with the Polish squadrons to good advantage. Flying escort to American bombers, Gabreski is at the controls of a new P-47 Thunderbolt. I was a, just like a kid with a new toy. I was very excited. I was over France during that uh, period of time. and. As I looked down, saw a bunch of 109s uh, in the area milling around, and I was in perfect position then because I was between the sun and the 109, so I came in with altitude to my advantage, and I caught this 109 in a climb, came in from behind, and I didn't slow down. I just went right on by with my eight guns blazing and practically blew up the airplane. The airplane went over on the side and uh, he hit the ground. As the war in Europe enters its final phase, air superiority belongs to the Allies. The internationals sense that their flags will rise again in triumph. But more fighter pilots will die before victory is won. 
I was privileged to fly with some very outstanding, unique, and wonderful people. And a lot of them, of course, didn't survive the war. And after the war, I felt that was very tragic. I went to see their next of kin, and I realized that these boys had no grave, no memorial. They'd just been blown away. It's very difficult to explain the spirit that you found uh, throughout, the, throughout the war. That, um, it was a pretty hard going. A lot of people got killed. But everybody uh, got made the best of it. We had, the camaraderie was terrific. Because I think that to begin with, the mishmash they had all nationalities, made it, it went for a huge, marvelous spirit. And it was a magnificent sort of feeling of esprit de corps engendered by the, the multitudes of nations all gathered together with a common cause. The international volunteers spoke a universal language of courage and dedication. Theirs is a special kind of glory.